Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Hannah and I make sex education content online and I was invited to a UNESCO conference about sexuality education in the digital space. What? Despite the levels of imposter syndrome that you get when you're invited to talk at a UNESCO conference, it's also very affirming that they invited you in the first place. That is very cool. So I just wanted to talk about my experience there and the things that I learned and what it was and what happened because, ooh, it was so interesting. So this video is going to come in several parts. First, what on earth was the event? Second, what on earth was I doing there? Three, what did I learn? What were my main takeaways of the event? Any interesting things from the talks that I would like to share with you? That's going to be the main chunk of the video. And then four, finally, some recommendations of some of the other YouTube creators that I met there from all around the world and other organizations that were present there that I just want to share with you some of the work that they're doing. So let's kick it off. What on earth was it? So the event was called Switched On Sexuality Education in the Digital Space and it was put on by UNESCO and UNFPA. So UNESCO is United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization and their whole mission is international cooperation in those areas and UNFPA is United Nations Population Fund. And on their website, they said, our mission is to deliver a world where every pregnancy is wanted, every childbirth is safe, and every young person's potential is fulfilled. So those are the people involved. That's what we were there to do. It took place in Istanbul, Turkey. And even though we were there, to be honest, spent most of my time at the conference and just saw the inside of a hotel. Did get a little bit of opportunities to explore Istanbul, which was gorgeous and really cool, but not enough time. I wanted more time. There were around 170 participants from over 70 countries. And I'm pretty sure that everyone who was there was speaking or presenting at some point. So everyone had a role to play. Everyone was demonstrating something, showing the work of the organization that they're from or the work that they do or speaking to their expertise on a panel. They also did this really cool thing where on the back of your lanyard, it said, we think you might be interested in meeting blank with a little bit of a description of who they were. And my person was Catherine Harry, who is a video creator and sex educator from Cambodia. And her Facebook page and YouTube channel is called A Dose of Kath. So that was really cool that they did that for everyone. They were like, this person and this person would probably want to meet and connect with each other. So that was a really cool little touch. And so what on earth was I doing there? I was doing three different sessions. Um, the first was a panel about powerful influencers and talking about the work that we do online and how we go about that. Then I did another discussion on sexuality and disability. And then the final session that I did was on content creation. So that was more of mini presentations and also panel discussion about the actual process of making video content. And also it was my birthday. And so I was spending it with a bunch of people that I had just met in a city I'd never been to before. But when we were having a little meeting about our panel that was gonna be the next morning, they surprised me with cake. Although Turkish desserts are a bit too sweet for me. But it's the thought that counts. And they surprised me with cake and it was amazing. And the evening of my birthday as well was when we went out more into the city center of Istanbul. We got dinner and by we, I mean just 
a bunch of new friends <laughs> who I'd never met before, but who are also young people making uh, sex education content online, um, and then just wandered to the streets of Istanbul for a bit um, and saw some of the lovely sights. So it was a very nice birthday. But moving on, what did I learn there? This is also coming to you in little subsections. So one of the first things that they did when we were all gathered together for the opening session was they had these statistics on the tables and we would like quiz each other on the tables about what they were. So these were the ones that were on my table and I just thought they'd be interesting to share with you. So the question was, what proportion of the global population are not connected to the internet? and apparently it's 46%. We had what proportion of young people aged 15 to 24 in Africa are connected to the internet, and that was 40%. What's the most popular online activity for children aged nine to 14? Apparently it's watching video clips. And what is the most popular device used to access the internet for children aged nine to 14? And it is the mobile phone. And then from a later presentation, I learned that Europe is 82% online and Africa is the lowest region, which is 28% online. So lots of work to do in terms of like the infrastructure of that. I also learned some new terminology. When you go to any kind of conference or if you're in any industry, there'll be certain shorthands that they use, little acronyms, initialisms, and I'm aware of RSC, Relationships and Sex Education, but people in presentations just kept on saying letters, and I was like, what are these letters that they're saying? I have no idea. So <clears throat> I'm gonna share with you my learnings. You might know these. I did not. So CSE is Comprehensive Sexuality Education. SRHR is Sexual and Reproductive Health Rights. If you add an A at the beginning of that, so ASRHR, it's Adolescent Sexual and Reproductive Health Rights. RSH, Reproductive and Sexual Health. And then Penetration. Now you might be thinking, Hannah, this is a conference about sex education and we all know what penetration is, but this is a different kind of penetration. It kept on being used to refer to the internet penetration rate of certain countries and regions. So how many people have access to the internet, use the internet, are familiar with the internet, how plugged in is it to that culture, that region? So yeah, the internet penetration rate. Mm -hmm. I'm so mature. Okay, and so now I want to go through some interesting points that I learned from some of the sessions, and I hope that you find them interesting too. So the first thing was some research from this organization called Restless Development. And they did some research into how young people use the internet in terms of learning about sex. Like, what kind of information are they looking for? How do they look for it? Um, what age groups are searching for what. It was very, very broad. But the reason I wanted to highlight this is because it's the first time I've ever really seen in quantitative data research anything about uh, trans and non-binary people. So there was a lot of data in different presentations around the fact that globally, um, boys often have more access to the internet than girls, which is not something that I realized. But these people in the study that they did um, included questions and data on trans and non-binary people. And I thought that was really interesting because although I'm aware that I have um, some people in my audience who are trans, who are non-binary, that's only because of comments. So qualitative, I can't speak, qualitative data. Whereas I don't have any quantitative data of that because every platform just gives me a gender split of men and women. So that's obviously very limited, but let me take you through some of the stuff that they found. So Restless Development are a youth-led development agency and they surveyed young people around the world for this and they found that gender non-conforming and non-binary young people were the most active group looking for information about sex and gender online. And I'm kind of not surprised because they're the, probably the people who are thinking about it the most because it's affecting them personally and the information that they might need to understand their gender and find similar people is, will be the, on the internet. Like that is where the information is because it can be so lacking in the real world. There's no such thing as the real world and the online world anymore. It's, it's on a continuum. That's what people kept on saying at the conference. It's all on a continuum. And then the other thing was that young people spend three to five hours per day online, um, but for trans men, that's five to seven hours. That's all they had in their presentation. I don't know what it is for trans women or non-binary people, but 
thought that might be interesting. Another interesting thing that kept coming up was about platforms. I'm reading from my iPad, I'm sorry I'm not looking up at you. I need to get myself an auto cue. That would be brilliant. For now, we're just reading from my notes here. Um, so I learned that young people learn more from digital spaces that do not intend to educate them rather than ones that do intend to. So for instance, YouTube and Instagram, it's not in their mission statement to educate the world about sex or like about anything, but it just so happens that the users of those platforms are creating educational content um, and then users are, are finding that. So the platforms themselves don't intend to educate, but that tends to be the place where young people are educated. Porn is probably another um, example of that. So that's like rather than websites and apps um, that are developed specifically for sex education for young people, those are being used less for that purpose than say YouTube. Someone mentioned in their presentation about how the fear of sexuality is built into society. And so that then feeds into tech infrastructures. We like to think of tech as being like above and beyond humans and culture and it being neutral, but it's not. Like that fear is built into our tech infrastructures and our tech platforms that we use. And this came up a lot in lots of different talks, but then also just in conversations having with people, the noticeable lack of presence of these tech companies at the event. I don't know whether they were invited. There was one guy from Google there, but he worked in like the public health, like brand ad side of YouTube. So not really on the product team or the engineering team that like would have helped with any of these issues. Considering how much these big platforms came up in conversation, uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, they, they weren't there. So we were asking all these questions, but couldn't like get answers from them. Like what is their responsibility when it comes to these things? The different levels of censorship that you might experience on these platforms. Yes, they are part of the problem, but then does that mean that they should be part of the solution too? A lot of talk about capitalism and them having to turn a profit. And that brings me to another interesting point, which was a lot of chat about censorship. And this was especially eye-opening to me because although I'm affected by certain levels of censorship from platforms, I'm not from my government, but there were people there who are from different countries where their national laws have levels of censorship in them. There was a great presentation about censorship and it talked about three different kinds of censorship. So active, passive, and auto. So active was like structural, political, patriarchal, and social, cultural kinds of censorship. Passive censorship refers to lack of funding or lack of partners. So in that scenario, it's more about bystanders. So these people aren't necessarily actively censoring anyone, but by doing nothing, these people are being censored because they're not being given the same opportunities. And auto-censorship is when something just doesn't get made in the first place for whatever reason. And I was trying to think what category the certain regulations that platforms have in place, like no female presenting nipples, and how on YouTube a lot of LGBTQ plus content gets demonetized or age restricted. And I kind of think that probably goes into the act of censorship because something has been done. I don't know if you have any other thoughts on whether that might be passive or auto, but I think it, it feels active to me because they've actively said, these are the community guidelines, right? And then it's interesting when laws like Foster Sesta, which is a US law, but the tech companies are based in the US, so it means that their worldwide users are affected by a US law. Those kinds of topics came up so much about censorship, about what different tech companies' um, responsibility and power is in those situations. And I did find it interesting that governments weren't talked about as much. Like they were still mentioned, but it really felt like the emphasis and like the big bad was these tech companies and maybe 
some focus also needs to be on what governments can do and the laws and regulations in different countries. But then that is obviously a country by country basis, whereas these tech platforms are global and have global reach, although are subject to American law. So, <laughs> and then finally, in what I learned, I wanted to talk about things that I learned from other creators. So what was really cool about this event was that there were other YouTubers there, other video creators, social media influencers. I would never have met these people and never been able to connect with them if it wasn't for this event. And that's because I only speak English and their content is in their own language. So I would never have been able to access their content. But Oh my God, so cool to meet them and hear their experiences. We even had a get together and like a big chat, like round table discussion about our experiences that wasn't even like on the agenda. We were just like, we need this. Like, how cool is this that we're all being connected right now? We need to have some space to actually talk amongst ourselves. And I genuinely learned so much from speaking to them. It definitely gave me a big perspective on how lucky I am to be creating sexuality content in the UK. I have so much respect for them for doing what they are doing. In the UK, I get praised for what I do by um, my audience, by the media, by the government even. Like I've done uh, brand deals and I've worked with Public Health England on campaigns. But for some of them, because of what they do, they are ostracized and criticized by their governments, by their media, and a lot of brands don't want to be associated with them. So that is a completely different story to hear, where a lot of brands do want to be associated with me because it's fashionable these days to be associated with feminism and sex positivity. Not only was it great to talk to other young people about creating, but also what their countries cultural and political attitudes are towards sex, towards women, towards LGBTQ plus people, and what they're doing within the means that they can, sometimes legally, sometimes just culturally, to help combat that. So yeah, talking to a lot of them did give me a huge amount of perspective on my privilege in creating sexuality content in the UK. Obviously, I still get backlash, but perspective. <laughs> and because of that, because of the privileged position that I'm in, it's really made clear to me even more so that part of my job is to pass the mic, is to raise awareness and tell people about these things. Not necessarily talk for people because I cannot speak on the political and cultural systems of other countries, but to signpost you to the people who are talking about that. So let me introduce you to my new friends. Um, some of them will have English subtitles on their videos, others don't. But if you are a native speaker from any of these countries, then here's some people to check out. And I'll leave links in the description to their YouTube videos, Instagram, Facebook pages, all of that stuff. So Nika Nixel Pixel from Russia, A Dose of Kath from Cambodia, Asia Says also from Russia, Hayden Royalty, um, South Korea, but their videos are in English because they were born and raised in America, Eldana Four Eyes from Kyrgyzstan, Tatiana um, from Russia, hers is a blog, Adriana from Romania, Raika Konru from Turkey, I'm pretty sure her videos are in Turkish, um, but she also lives in Canada now, Trashmash from Belarus, and Cecilia from Argentina. So those are a lot of the people who I met who are also content creators and I'll leave all of their links in the description. And it wasn't just content creators at this event, it was loads of NGOs, different content developers making websites, apps, different services for young people. So I'm also going to leave in the description all of them. I'll probably do it by country so that that can help you uh, find some cool resources um, that will be relevant to you. Thanks so much for watching this video and thank you so much to UNESCO for inviting me to Switched On and just 
putting on a really enriching and inspiring event. I'm definitely feeling more sure than ever that making sex education content is what I'm passionate about, what I'm meant to be doing, and I hope that you guys enjoy it and learn from it and share it. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and make sure that you subscribe for more sexuality content every Tuesday and hit the notification bell if you haven't already and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!